Hi, it's Katrina. Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave in Kentucky is a natural wonder and a creepy tomb. Researchers have found human remains in the cave dating back thousands of years from ancient Indians to explorers. The first people to inhabit the cave arrived 12,000 years ago, leaving behind tools and petroglyphs. Later on, different groups would come to the cave to take shelter. During the French and Indian Wars, the Shawnee and Cherokee would use the caves to plan. Over time, the caves became famous for nitrate and saltpeter production, mostly carved out and prepared by slaves for the War of 1812. Then there was the discovery of mummies. Slaves and miners became tour guides for brave tourists in the 1800s, but exploring the caves was extremely dangerous. Visitors reported seeing discarded moccasins, torches, and mummified bodies. Archaeologists were able to determine the artifacts were 4,000 years old, and tourists from all over the world would come to see the caves. One of the mummies was discovered crushed by a rock in pre-Columbian times. A two-ton rock had fallen from above, and the body had been naturally preserved by the conditions in the cave. In the 1930s, researchers decided to lift the rock to better examine the mummy. It was moved to the cave floor and placed in a glass display to stop people from touching it. Over time, more caves and artifacts were found, and scientists believe there is a lot more to be discovered. It's the longest explored cave system in the world, with over 360 miles of connected tunnels. And you never know what you might find around the next bend. Have you ever been here? Would you like to visit Mammoth Cave? Let me know in the comments below. Turtle Graveyard This chilling graveyard at the bottom of an ocean cave is full of turtle bones. The cave is an intricate maze of chambers and corridors in sharp contrast to the beautiful transparent waters in Malaysia. While vacationing in Saipatan Island in 2019, photographer Josh Vergara discovered a cave full of dead turtles. He snapped photos of the disturbing scene, which went viral online. But Vergara was not the first person to encounter the submerged reptile cemetery. Ocean explorer Captain Jacques Cousteau discovered the cave in the 1980s while filming a documentary off the coast of Borneo. He and his team spotted a lot of bones and skeletons of sea turtles, and he suggested that aging turtles traveled there to die in peace. It's a nice guess, but the truth is a bit more sinister. Turtles and other air-breathing creatures die in the underwater cave labyrinth because they become disoriented and can't find their way out. Unable to surface and breathe, they eventually asphyxiate in the nearly 2,000-foot deep cavern. The entrance is on the side of a large limestone wall about 65 feet below the surface. Cave diving can be quite dangerous, and the skeletons are also a grim reminder of what could happen to an inexperienced diver who dares to enter the maze. Our Ancestors' Tools Understanding the complex and mysterious human family tree is an ongoing process among researchers who consistently work to disentangle the mysteries of our collective past. Finally, researchers have been able to use cutting-edge technology to get us one step closer. In an article published late last year in the journal Nature Human Behavior, researchers from the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel re-examined a collection of ancient stone tools that were found in Kesem Cave. This cave is a Paleolithic archaeological site in the country's central region that has a history of early hominid occupation dating back 400,000 years. The people who lived there were predecessors to both modern humans and extinct human species. They left behind thousands of stone tools, which they fashioned from readily available flint using a process called napping, which involves honing a sharp edge using another rock or tool. Tools dating back to less than 100,000 years ago, when more recent hominid groups occupied the site, show that people put the flint in the fire, making it easier to work with when crafting a tool. This left the team wondering if earlier occupants engaged in the same practice. To answer that question, they first had to determine if there were any ways to tell that such old artifacts had been heated by fire. This is a difficult task, since the structure of flint varies widely. Any signs of past heating would be microscopic or smaller, perhaps nearly impossible to detect. Using a groundbreaking technique called Raymond spectroscopy, the researchers heated and examined flint samples from the Kassem cave. They determined that the site's inhabitants established different heating techniques for different items. For example, small nicked shards called pot lids were heated to the point where pieces of flint would fly off the object. Small cutting tools called flakes were exposed to a variety of temperatures, while blades were treated within a small range of lower temperatures. These variations show that early people deliberately adjusted the heat levels for firing specific objects, making the practice one of the earliest known examples of ancient humans developing technology to enhance their survival. Cave of the Jaguar God 
In 2019, Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History announced the discovery of a cave system containing more than 150 ritual artifacts, which sat untouched for over 1,000 years in the ancient Maya city of Chichen Itza on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The sacred wells in the cave system known as cenotes were sacred spaces for the Maya. Farmers originally discovered the cave system known as Balamku, or the Cave of the Jaguar God, in 1966. An archaeologist named Victor Segovia Pinto visited the site, noted in his records that it contained a lot of archaeological material and had the cave's entrance sealed off without performing any excavations. Then his records went missing. It's not really clear why he decided to cover up such an incredible discovery. Over a half century later, the cave was reopened as part of the Great Maya Aquifer Project, which seeks to find the ancient city's water table. National Geographic explorer Guillermo de Anda spent hours sliding and crawling through dark, narrow tunnels before spotting an assemblage of artifacts, which included vases, incense burners, decorative plates, and other items. De Anda's team soon identified seven ritual offering chambers that the Maya used. Meanwhile, another expert working on the project was able to locate Segovia's missing report. It noted that some of the artifacts bore sacred Seba tree markings and images of the Toltec rain god Tlaloc. For the ancient Maya, caves and cenotes were considered openings to the underworld, Maya cave expert Holly Moyes told National Geographic. The cave archaeology is relatively new. In the past, everyone was more interested in monumental architecture and solid artifacts. But this aquifer project is using all kinds of 3D mapping technology and paleobotany, all kinds of things that can tell us more about what Maya rituals were like. The discovery of the caves is giving researchers a rare opportunity to examine the untouched site using advanced technology, which could offer invaluable insight into Chichen Itza's history and mysterious decline. Archaeologist De Anda hopes that with all of this new technology, archaeology will become a more useful science and we can have much more context of what was happening in the most dramatic moments in history. Mogao Caves In the desert of northwestern China in the country's Gansu province, along the former Silk Road trade route, is a series of 500 hand-carved caves housing ancient Buddhist temples. Known as the Mogao Caves, the cave temples of Dun Huang and the Caves of the Thousand Buddhas, they contain exquisite Buddhist art spanning a 1,000-year period, starting when the first caves were dug out in 366 AD. The caves were rediscovered during the late 19th and early 20th centuries amid a revived interest in the ancient Silk Road and its so-called Lost Cities. There have been many fascinating and significant discoveries within the vast system of temples. In 1900, the site's discoverer and self-appointed guardian, a Taoist monk named Wang Yuanlu, retrieved a collection of 50,000 documents known as the Dun Huang Manuscripts from a cavern that had been sealed off since the 11th century, known as the Library Cave. Archaeologists from around the world flocked to the caves, where they encountered the world's largest Buddhist art collection. Paintings feature Buddhist-themed stories and portraits, as well as images of cave donors, and depict everyday scenes from the times when they were created. Over 2,000 vividly painted clay sculptures are found throughout the caves, with the largest measuring more than 100 feet tall. Legend holds that a monk began excavating the temples by hand after receiving a vision of 1,000 Buddhas bathed in golden sunlight at the site. Artifacts of Confucian, Taoist, and Christian origin, and texts written in Chinese, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Old Turkish, and Hebrew show that the many cultures intersected at the Mogao Caves via the Silk Road. The Mogao Caves were abandoned by the 15th century after the historic trade route fell into disuse. Thankfully, due to their remoteness and the dry desert climate, the contents were found in a remarkable state of preservation, offering modern scholars and curious minds a fascinating glimpse into the bustling Silk Road's past. Jersey Teeth It's a known scientific fact that humans and Neanderthals interbred. In fact, Neanderthal DNA comprises up to 2% of the genomes of all modern, non-African human populations. While genetic evidence rules out any doubts about these interspecies encounters, there is a lack of compelling physical evidence of human-Neanderthal hybrids. A recent analysis of 11 45,000-year-old teeth is proving to be a game-changer, however. Archaeologists discovered the teeth in 1910 and 1911 in a cave on the island of Jersey in the Channel Islands, an archipelago located in the English Channel. They were only recently studied in depth by scientists who noticed that the teeth bear an unusual mix of human and Neanderthal features, 
indicating that the two individuals they belonged to were hybrids. The long roots are characteristically Neanderthal, while the crowns and upper parts of the teeth are more human. The discovery could bring experts one step closer to solving long-standing mysteries, including why Neanderthals went extinct and why there is only one human species today instead of several, like during the Stone Age. Researchers plan to examine whether the Neanderthal survival ability was affected by interbreeding with humans. Other artifacts discovered in and around the Jersey Cave, including large amounts of food debris and hundreds of stone tools, indicate that the site was a hunting base for a population that at times was well-fed, feasting on reindeer, bison, woolly rhinos, and woolly mammoths. But the teeth bear signs of weeks-long periods of stress, likely caused by malnutrition, showing that the residents struggled at least occasionally. Scientists hope to learn more about the mixed heritage Jersey cave inhabitants through DNA and isotopic analysis. World's Oldest Cave Painting One day, nearly 46,000 years ago, an ancestor of modern-day humans used red ochre pigment to paint a life-sized image of a wild pig on a cave wall on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi. Found in the remote Liang Tedongne cave, the artwork is evidence of the region's earliest known human settlement, according to a recently published scientific report. The people who made it were fully modern, and they were just like us. They had all of the capacity and the tools to do any painting that they liked, explained study co-author Maxime Aubert, who determined the painting's age by examining a calcite deposit that had formed over it using isotope dating. The calcite deposit is 45,500 years old, meaning the image itself is at least that old and could be much older, making it the world's earliest known cave painting of an animal. There are two handprints above the 53 by 21 inch pig, which appears to be watching a fight or some other activity going on between two other pigs. Experts believe that modern humans stopped in Sulawesi on their way to Australia as much as 65,000 years ago and are increasingly turning their attention to the island, which they believe may hold many more artifacts left behind by some of mankind's earliest migrants. Opposable Thumbs At some point, our early ancestors evolved to have opposable thumbs that enable them to grasp objects with the precision necessary to craft tools. This dexterity majorly helped ancient humans survive beyond a baseline level, helping to open the door to technological advancements that greatly enhanced their, and consequently our, quality of life. While other primates have opposable thumbs, our ability to bring our thumb into contact with our fingers set us apart. Naturally, researchers are curious about when this quality developed and its relation to toolmaking and other cultural advancements. In an attempt to get to the bottom of these mysteries, experts examined hand fossils of modern humans, chimpanzees, and numerous Pleistocene-era hominids, including Neanderthals, three Australopithecus species, and more. Some of the fossils they analyzed belonged to a species that were discovered in caves, including Homo naledi specimens, which were first found in South Africa's Rising Star cave system, and two unidentified fossils that were unearthed in the same country at Swartzkren's cave. The team calculated each species' manual dexterity by focusing on where a specific hand muscle would have been located in relation to the bone. They determined that all the Pleistocene-era hominids they examined, including Homo naledi and the mysterious species found at Swartkrans, possessed highly efficient thumb opposition, meaning this impressive trait goes back at least two million years to the earliest chapter of the Homo lineage. The findings make sense. Evidence shows that around the same time, early cultures became noticeably more complex and tool use increased throughout Africa. Not all scholars are convinced, believing that it's harder than that to learn about the muscle morphology of early hominids. Whether the findings are completely accurate or not, the study may ultimately prove useful in helping scientists fill in the gaps of human history's fragmented record. Las Gil Paintings for more than three decades, the semi-autonomous region of Somaliland, located within Somalia, has had its own flag, military, and currency. Its government has campaigned vigorously, but unsuccessfully, for international recognition of its independence. In a recent Washington Post article, journalist Max Barak revealed that those seeking to keep the fight for Somaliland's independence alive are now turning to a surprising argument to support their claims – archaeology. By gaining independence, Somaliland would have much better access to funding necessary for preserving historical sites and artifacts within the territory, and could more effectively develop its tourism industry. In 2002, a team of French archaeologists learned of a collection of cave artwork known as the Las Guilles paintings. 
Locals had long known about the paintings, which include depictions of humans, dogs, cows, giraffes, antelopes, monkeys, and more. The artwork is thought to be somewhere between 5,000 and 11,000 years old, and features scenes of people worshipping a cow-like creature and of a woman taking care of a dog. Little else is known about the paintings and the people who created them. These priceless pieces of human history are already damaged, and they stand to become ruined if nothing is done to preserve them. While critics argue that politicizing archaeology does more harm than good, it seems to happen all the time. Hidden Cave System Castle Olsen in southern Poland is rumored to lie on top of many secret passageways and tunnels. In August last year, archaeologists announced the discovery of a suspected network of tunnels and crevices attached to the large cave underneath the castle adding some truth to the numerous legends. Today, the 14th century structure stands in ruins. Dr. Mikolaj Urbanowski says that tests revealed a gigantic void measuring up to 23 feet deep. Excavations are ongoing with the help of cavers, who are on standby to assist the team. Numerous valuable artifacts have already been unearthed at the site, including Neanderthal tools that may be as much as 40,000 years old, which were found in the cave under the castle, as well as a medieval tile depicting a falcon hunter. The lower cave, as it's called, served as a Neanderthal shelter and later as a Renaissance-era pantry. More discoveries are likely to be made as the explorations into the subterranean structures continue. Tyrannosaur Embryo Fossils A recent discovery of baby tyrannosaurs shows that some of the largest predators started life about the size of a chihuahua. National Geographic reports that the fossils of an itty-bitty foot claw and a lower jaw belong to tyrannosaurs still in the embryonic stage. The little bones were first overlooked, but after a 3D scan and reconstruction, paleontologists could see that they were baby tyrannosaurs. This is the first time that we can piece them together to see what they looked like. The babies were one-tenth as long as grown dinosaurs, measuring about three feet long with sharp teeth. While three feet might seem huge, they were tiny compared to 30-foot-long adults. Based on this size, the eggs were probably about 17 inches long. Before this discovery, no one really knew anything about baby tyrannosaurs. Turns out that mothers probably were nesting in the same areas as other species of dinosaur, and scientists are hoping that there are more that might be hiding in museum collections. The search is now on for little fossils. Thumb Spiked Iguanodon there's still a lot of information we don't know about the extinct creatures that once dominated our planet. One look at the Iguanodon and you may see exactly why these prehistoric creatures were ones to be feared. A very distinctive feature of the Iguanodon was their enormous thumb spikes. When the dinosaur was first discovered in 1825, paleontologists believed the conical bony spike was set into the dinosaur's nose, like some sort of rhino horn. Maybe it was like a rhinoceros iguana. It wasn't until a more complete iguanodon was found in a Belgian coal mine in the late 1870s that the horn was found to belong to the dinosaur's hands instead, like some sort of hooved mitten. But what exactly was the spike used for? Originally, most believed that it was used for defense, possibly to attack other dinosaurs who posed a threat like some sort of weapon. But when put into practice, this would actually be really difficult. The iguanodon would have to be right in front of its attacker, in close range, and the attacker would have to be standing still for it to have any effect. Maybe they used the spikes to combat one another, or perhaps used it more like a tool to break into seeds and fruits, dig and scrape branches and bark off trees. Perhaps it was everything. Living 135 million years ago during the early Cretaceous period, the iguanodon would have had to stand up to some pretty ferocious foes. It's believed they may have traveled in small herds and could even run on their two hind legs if necessary to protect themselves. Dinosaurs had ticks. Looks like ticks bothered dinosaurs tens of millions of years ago. Tiny fossils preserved in resin and amber dating back to the Cretaceous period show blood-filled parasites, including ticks, with pieces of feather. Possibly a dinosaur feather or a primitive type of bird. Scientists aren't able to pinpoint the exact host, but modern birds can be ruled out since they appeared 25 million years after the age of the amber. A lump of amber from Burma had an engorged tick that had just finished a meal before it was caught in tree sap. This one was eight times its original size. Jurassic Park is getting closer. Although, don't get too excited because DNA is pretty fragile, and the process that creates amber is really extreme and unlikely to preserve it. These amber finds were some of the first that proved that parasitic insects plagued the animals of the Cretaceous period. Spinosaurs 
Remember when we thought the T-Rex was the most intimidating dinosaur out there? But then in Jurassic Park 3, that huge vicious dinosaur fights the T-Rex and we learned that there are scarier dinosaurs that existed, like the Spinosaurus. While there is much debate as to how the Spinosaurus was portrayed in the movie, it inspired many to learn more about it. A fossilized Spinosaurus was unearthed from 95 million year old rocks in Morocco and instantly, its unusual shape set off a firestorm in paleontology, with suggestions that the dinosaur may have even been an excellent swimmer. Spinosaurus is famous for its enormous size and large sail on its back connected by spines. Measuring 49 to 52 feet long, it weighed 6.4 to 7.5 metric tons. The Spinosaurus had a paddle-shaped tail that helped it slice through the water. It would float like a crocodile waiting for prey. With most initially believing dinosaurs were solely land dwellers, the Spinosaurus was thought to have lived near water and dined on seafood, using its cone-shaped teeth to snag slippery fish. But the discovery of its paddle-shaped tail containing long spines and bony projections on the vertebrae showed that the Spinosaurus could possibly have spent more time in the water than originally thought. Surprisingly flexible, the tail also had long chevrons at the base that allowed the animal a wide range of movement. By comparing the Spinosaurus to other theropods, researchers could see that they had stiffer tails, which suggested their tail shape evolved over time. Dr. Paul Sereno, professor of paleontology at the University of Chicago, says that when Spinosaurus was on land, it probably avoided other large predators. But in a fight, whoever got in the first big bite would usually win. In the Jurassic Park film, the Tyrannosaurus got in the first big bite, and with a bite force of 3.5 to 23.5 metric tons, the T-Rex should have bitten the Spinosaurus head off. Yikes. Majungasaurus preyed on its own. While it's not difficult to imagine dinosaurs battling one another, you wouldn't assume that any one dinosaur would turn on its own kind. But when it comes to the Majungasaurus, the discovery of one of the dinosaur's fossils with tooth marks from another Majungasaurus shows that nature has pretty much always been scary. Greek for giant lizard, the Majungasaurus roamed the Earth in the late Cretaceous period from 60 to 70 million years ago. Weighing in at one ton and stretching about 20 feet long, the dinosaur had a short blunt snout and a spike on its forehead. Native to Madagascar, the dinosaur wasn't necessarily a cannibal, but the discovery of Majungasaurus bones sporting Majungasaurus bite marks proved that they did hunt down their own kind. But was it a result of a lack of food, or did they dine on the carcasses of dead siblings? It's hard to tell, but with so much competition for food, the Majungasaurus probably couldn't afford to be too picky about its next meal. It might not be the habitual cannibal, but every now and then. The Majungasaurus also had another unique feature. They had to replace their entire set of teeth every two months. Similar to sharks, this meant that they were able to grow replacement teeth much faster than other meat eaters. Was this because their teeth would dull down so quickly because they were gnawing on so many bones? This find makes the Majungasaurus that much more of a fearsome predator that even their own species need to keep a watchful eye on. Bat-like dinosaur in China. More than 160 million years ago, in the forests of ancient China, a tiny dinosaur glided from tree to tree. A new fossil found from a feathered dinosaur with large membranes on its arms is evidence that this dinosaur had leathery, bat-like wings. A member of a group of non-avian dinosaurs, the Ambopteryx, is providing researchers with insight into the evolution of flight among ancient animals. The first dinosaur that was ever found with bat-like wings is the Yi Qi, whose name means strange wing. Discovered in 2017 in a village in northeastern China, researchers originally believed it was the remains of an early bird. But as the excavation continued and the remains were removed from the rock, scientists realized that it wasn't a bird and instead an omnivore who ate both plants and animals. The Yi Qi was about the size of a pigeon and had long bony rods on each of his hands that extend from the wrist that seem to support a membrane like that of a flying squirrel or a bat. But there were still skeptics as to the origin of the Yi Qi and the strange bones that jutted from its wrists. Paleontologists believed that it could be there to prop up a large winged membrane, but it wasn't until the fossil of the Ambopteryx was found that this theory could be proven. Discovered with the fossil was the preserved remnants of a brownish film on one wing that researchers believe could be traces of the winged membrane. Fossilized feathers and fused tail vertebrae that anchored the tail feathers, like in living birds, were also found. 
By studying the bones, researchers could determine that it would have been well suited to glide among trees with feet that allowed it to perch on branches. Even though it might not seem that terrifying given the fact that this species only weighed a few hundred grams, the winged bat-like dinosaur would have been a shocking sight to see. A tail with a sonic boom. Another impressive and terrifying dinosaur belongs to the sauropods, and it's known as the Apatosaurus. Considered one of the largest land animals of all time, they weighed up to 45 tons and measured about 70 to 75 feet long from head to tail. They had massive pillar-like legs and a long tail that it swung by shifting its weight or stomping its feet, and when it did so, it would have created an incredibly loud and obnoxious noise. Its length allowed the dinosaur to be able to crack a supersonic sound similar to a bullwhip. The males of the species may have tried to outdo one another when competing for females and would crack their whip-like tails to impress them. Or the noise would serve as either a warning to a predator or to other fearsome sauropods challenging them. To prove their theory, paleontologists created a model tail of an apatosaurus using aluminum, stainless steel, neoprene, and Teflon. The model, which stretched 12 feet long, was only one quarter of the size of a sauropod tail, but it was still able to produce a distinctive crack that could break the sound barrier when whipped around. Bone Breaking Tail Although the Ankylosaurus probably couldn't kill the Tyrannosaurus rex, new research suggests the club at the end of the dinosaur's tail could have definitely broken its ankles. Canadian researchers set out to prove their theory by examining CT scans of fossilized tails from dinosaurs of different sizes. By combining images with measurements of the dinosaur's backbone, they determined the Ankylosaurus could swing its tail in a 100-degree arc, making an effective club that could generate forces strong enough to crush bone. Scientists speculate that the heavily armored Ankylosaurus used their tail to fend off other dinosaurs. Using the CT data and three-dimensional computer modeling, scientists studied whether this club in their tail could be a weapon. By calculating the volume, mass, and impact speed of small and large club tails from dinosaurs, researchers found that the tightly interlocked vertebrae of the bony ball on the end of the dinosaur's tail could generate between 364 and 718 megapascal of impact stress, more than enough needed to break bones. Juvenile Ankylosaurus didn't have a knob at the end. Their tails slowly developed as their armor did. By looking at rib fractures among adult Ankylosaurus, researchers found that those with more broken ribs could have been competing for mates and bludgeoning one another with their tail clubs. Even though this research uses fossilized remains to create hypotheses about these ancient animals, paleontologists continue to study to see if the club tails of the Ankylosaurus family were just for show, or if they were used to bludgeon other dinosaurs in the test for survival. Dinosaur with no arms 70 million years ago, a carnivorous dinosaur known as the Carnotaurus roamed. Unknown to science until they were discovered in the mid-1980s, these dinosaurs were part of the Abelosaurus family, who arose in the mid-Jurassic period from horned ceratosaurs. Known for their long, low bodies and short heads with upturned upper jaws, the dinosaurs had a somewhat pug-faced look compared to other theropods. They had short, stout teeth and small arms. The Abelosaurus had front limbs that were so small they may not even have been visible outside the body. The Carnotaurus had a tail vertebrae pointed sideways in bony projections that grew out and upward in sharp, sickle-shaped designs. It also had a pair of horns above its eyes, and because of their strong neck muscles, it's believed they used their horns to deliver fast and powerful blows in combat between other Carnotaurs, or possibly to show their dominance over their territory, or to garner breeding rights with the female species. Even though the Carnotaurus had remarkably tiny arms, the dinosaur was well-suited for head-to-head -head combat. As paleontologists studied the shape of the dinosaur's tail vertebrae, they found that they would have been quite fast, proving that even the more stout dinosaurs had adapted to use their traits to their advantage. World's Largest Raptor In 1991, a paleontologist and his crew were excavating a bone bed outside of Moab, Utah. It was filled with dinosaur fossils dating back 125 million years. While they were excavating an armored dinosaur called Gastonia, they found the front jaw from a theropod, a class of dinosaurs that includes carnivores like the T-Rex. Later on, they found a large curved sickle claw that they believed belonged to a velociraptor, but this one was twice as big. Dubbing the dinosaur the Utah Raptor, scientists worked to uncover the mystery of these large predatory carnivores, estimated to stretch 23 feet long and weigh around 1,000 pounds. 
Putting together the story of the raptor was tricky, but after comparing another batch of bones from a different dig, they were able to piece together what it looked like. After combining bones from various dinosaurs to piece together a better version, scientists realized that the claws on each hand of the Utah raptor had been specialized for cutting. The teeth of the front and lower jaw angled forward, further than other raptors. It makes sense considering the Utah raptor was a carnivorous dinosaur, and in studying various dinosaur teeth, researchers found that the species used a grip-and-rip feeding style, meaning the dinosaurs would bite and pull backward, letting their teeth do the work. With recent discoveries connecting related dinosaurs, including the Velociraptor, Allosaurus, and Deinonychus, evidence suggested that the Utah raptor would have been covered in feathers, and that they were pretty thick and stout. Scientists are now hoping to preserve the quarry where they were found as a state park, in order to look for more amazing dinosaurs. Goliath Frog Weighing up to 7.2 pounds, around the same size as a newborn baby, the Goliath Frog is the world's largest frog. It can grow to the size of a typical house cat, reaching as much as 12 and a half inches long. Goliath frogs have been around for roughly 250 million years and are one of few amphibians from before the time of the dinosaurs that are still around today. They are found in the African countries of Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea. Despite their size, they start out as tadpoles no bigger than those of other frog species, but seem to continuously grow throughout their lives. They have recently been observed making nests by gathering rocks and creating a little circle. Some of the rocks weighed 4.4 pounds, more than half of the frog's weight in some cases. Scientists know little else about the Goliath frog, including whether there is more than one species and how long they live on average. The Goliath frog is considered endangered mainly due to human activities. They are hunted for food and the exotic pet trade, and also face habitat loss from farming, logging, and encroaching human settlements. Adult specimens are largely targeted for the pet trade, leaving conservationists worried that the breeding population will no longer be viable at some point. Equatorial Guinea limits the annual export of Goliath frogs to 300, and this seems to be having a positive effect on the population, although the amphibian's ultimate fate remains to be seen. Griffin flies. Some of the largest known insects that ever existed were giant dragonfly-like predators called griffin flies from the extinct Meganeropsis genus. They very much resembled modern-day dragonflies, but are only distantly related to them and were much bigger, with bodies measuring over a foot and a half long and wingspans of up to two and a half feet across. That's Jumanji size right there. These primitive insects lived before the dinosaurs, appearing on the fossil record between 317 million and 247 million years ago, making for a surprisingly short-lived existence. There were two known Meganeropsis species, which were both identified based on partial fossils found in North America. They evolved to such a large size because the atmosphere's oxygen content was much higher at the time. Simply put, breathing was easier for these creatures than it is for today's insects, enabling griffin flies and other land-dwelling invertebrates to become massive. Meganeropsis died out during the end Permian extinction event, which eradicated roughly 90% of the Earth's living creatures, making it the most devastating of the five known extinction events ever to occur on the planet. Known as the Great Dying, it marks one of few known extinction events that saw a massive die-off of insects. The world's oxygen levels decreased following this widespread annihilation of animal and plant life, so consequently, insects never reached their former gargantuan proportions. Giant Huntsman Spider You'd probably agree that the idea of a spider the size of a dinner plate is utterly terrifying, but such a thing actually exists. Discovered in Laos in 2001, the giant huntsman spider is the world's largest spider by leg span, measuring up to a foot across. While the goliath bird eater is the most massive, huntsman spiders have longer legs and just look enormous too. This cave-dwelling species hails from the family of large, fast-moving huntsman spiders. Named for their hunting technique of tracking down prey rather than capturing them in webs, these spiders can be venomous, and some species are capable of inflicting extremely painful bites on humans. Huntsmen are usually encountered in Australia, hanging out in people's kitchens or cars. Most people are unlikely to encounter a giant huntsman spider, and even if you do, your safety is probably not at risk. The giant huntsman spider eats insects, and sometimes each other. Like most other animals, they are more threatened by humans than we are by them. 
Following its discovery, apparently everyone wanted to have one of these rare, enormous spiders. But the giant huntsman spider typically cannot survive for very long outside its natural habitat, and its numbers are decreasing as more and more are removed from their environment. Titanoboa South America's tropical jungles were vastly different during prehistoric times than they are today. For one, everything was bigger, including plants and animals. Crocodiles exceeded 33 feet in length, seven-foot-long lungfish tripled the size of those today, and turtles were the size of cars. The titanoboa was arguably the most alarmingly huge creature that lived in the area at the time. Measuring over 40 feet long and weighing more than one ton, it was the largest snake that ever existed. The thickest part of its body was nearly as tall as a grown man's waist. When a skull was found in Colombia, scientists were finally able to confirm its large size and its relationship to other snakes. It turned out there were many bone samples and vertebrae in universities all over, but they were so large, nobody knew that they were from a snake. Paleontologist Jonathan Bloch from the University of Florida said it was like somebody handed me a mouse skull the size of a rhinoceros and told me that's a mouse. It's just not possible. While the titanoboa looked like a gigantic boa constrictor, scientists believe that it hunted more like an anaconda, devouring pretty much any animal whole. When the dinosaurs died out, the creature rose to the top of the food chain and became king of the jungle. The titanoboa evolved to its massive proportions due to the hot jungle climate, which acted as an external heat source, enabling the cold-blooded serpent to move and live at its full potential. To give you an idea, the species dwarf today's anacondas, which typically only reach 15 feet long and rarely exceed 500 pounds. Almost no animal was safe from this apex predator, but the titanoboa nevertheless went extinct around 56 million years ago for reasons that remain unknown. The prevailing theory suggests that a cooling climate made metabolism difficult for this snake and other large reptiles, while proving advantageous for smaller creatures. Giant Otter While the wildlife in modern-day South America is nowhere near as large as it once was, the continent is still home to some impressively huge creatures. For example, the giant otter. Found throughout the Amazon basin, this species reaches up to six and a half feet long, more than twice the length of the next largest member of the weasel family, and can weigh as much as 75 pounds. It's the world's largest otter species. Giant otters may have grown bigger in the past, with some accounts putting exceptionally large specimens at up to eight feet long. It's most likely that excessive hunting prevented them from getting as big as they used to be. Otters can be extremely territorial and will fight fiercely to protect their families. The BBC has captured footage of the otters harassing caimans and jaguars by going for their tail and biting. Adults will gather together and hold them down and bite them on the head repeatedly. Also called river jaguars, they have a very eerie laugh when they get together. While they will also fall prey to animals like caiman and jaguars, humans are by far the giant otter's biggest threat. Hunting them was banned in 1975, but humans are now encroaching on giant otters by settling in their territory, resulting in habitat loss for the species. Despite its size, a giant otter is unlikely to attack a human unless it feels directly threatened, and has far more reasons to fear us than the other way around. As measures are increasingly taken to protect the species, its numbers are starting to improve. For now, the giant otter's future remains cautiously optimistic. Sea Scorpion In 2007, scientists announced the discovery of Jacolopterus renaniae, the largest sea scorpion and arthropod that ever existed. Measuring up to 8.2 feet long, it readily exceeded the size of a human. The species lived between 460 million and 255 million years ago and was not a true sea scorpion. It did live in lakes and rivers, but probably rarely or never entered the ocean. It was an ancestor of modern sea scorpions called a Eurypterid. Scientists identified the creature based on a foot and a half long claw discovered in a quarry in Prume, Germany. This was all that was left of the specimen. Scientists collected information on other sea scorpions and the ratio between their claw size and body length. When you work out how big this beast was, this monster was bigger than an adult human. It's unknown why prehistoric scorpions were so much larger than those that exist today. One theory attributes their gigantic size to higher oxygen levels in the atmosphere, while another proposes that a lack of predators may have allowed these creepy crawlers to grow. Both ideas are plausible, especially considering Jacolopterus's predatory abilities. This huge monster lived alongside other sea scorpions and fish, explained study author Simon Brady, who further added they would probably lie in wait, 
When another animal went in front of it, it would lurch forward and capture it. These things would tear their prey to shreds and then eat the little pieces. Yikes, imagine that lurking in the lake, like we didn't have enough to worry about already. Giant Oarfish As the world's largest bony fish, the giant oarfish grows up to 56 feet long. Even though it's so big, the species is rarely seen and scientists know very little about it. The giant oarfish lives deep in the ocean, about 3,280 feet below sea level. In 2013, two giant oarfish washed ashore on California beaches. This was concerning for scientists because members of the species only tend to surface when they die or become injured. Biologist Milton Love told National Geographic that strong currents and swells likely killed the specimens and pulled them to shore. While it's believed that giant oarfish inspired legendary tales about terrifying sea serpents, they are harmless to humans. They eat plankton and lack actual teeth, instead eating through specialized structures called gill feeders. People believe that seeing an oarfish is a bad omen because that means that something bad is going to happen. When many of them wash ashore, people in some countries like Japan take it as a sign of an impending natural disaster, most likely an earthquake and possible tsunami. While scientists do not consider this a reliable way of measuring what's to come, a 2010 Japan Times article revealed that there may be some validity to this belief. Because of the extreme depths where oarfish live, they are sensitive to active fault movement, and there seems to be a correlation between earthquakes and oarfish that wash up on shore. Gargantuan Millipedes Some of the largest arthropods and insects ever to roam the planet came from the extinct Arthropleura genus of invertebrates. They are related to modern-day centipedes and millipedes, strongly resembling the latter. The biggest among them grew as much as six and a half feet long and sometimes reached over a foot and a half wide. In other words, at one time, a millipede-like creature longer than the height of an average adult human graced the Earth. Arthropleura lived in what is now northeastern North America and Scotland between 340 and 280 million years ago during the Carboniferous period. They may very well qualify as the largest ever terrestrial invertebrates. Although no complete fossils have been found, fossilized segments and other body parts act as a testament to the insect's size. Tracks are also an indicator of how large Arthropleura could grow, with a set of footprints found in Nova Scotia, Canada measuring 19.7 inches wide. Researchers estimated that the animal who left them behind was at least 5.6 feet long. Their size may have resulted from increased oxygen levels in the atmosphere during the time of their existence. The fact that Arthropleura had few, if any, natural predators also likely helped to bolster their size. Despite this advantageous position, these prehistoric bugs were herbivores, much like modern millipedes, and they were ultimately defenseless against the conditions that wiped them out. Scientists believe that Arthropleura went extinct when the climate dried up and reduced the creature's rainforest habitat. The Super Croc in 1997, paleontologists working in Niger found the human-sized jawbone of a supercroc, Sarcosuchus imperator, a giant relative of modern crocodiles and the largest known crocodilian that ever lived. It grew up to twice the length of today's biggest crocodiles, reaching as much as 39 feet long and growing continuously throughout its lifetime. Its jaw alone measured up to 6 feet long, and they had teeth the size of bananas. Weighing up to 8 tons, the species tipped the scales at around four times the weight of their modern counterparts. The super croc dwelled in the rivers of what is now North Africa between 133 million and 112 million years ago during the early Cretaceous period. At the time, what is now the Sahara Desert was a lush tropical rainforest environment that was flush with rivers. Its life on the water helped it reach its massive size. By floating, the reptile was able to carry more weight than it would have been able to as a land animal. The creature's powerful jaw, filled with 130 teeth, also helped, enabling it to easily hunt large prey, including fish and small dinosaurs. But the super croc's huge size may have also played a role in its downfall. Some scientists speculate that limited mobility, limited space to live, or both, may have contributed to the super croc's extinction. Paleontologist Paul Serino, who discovered the massive jawbone I told you about, believes that the creature was already rare to begin with. In that case, disease or disaster could have easily spelled the end for the super croc. Truth be told, scientists do not exactly know what wiped out this terrifyingly massive reptile. Secret Tunnel Archaeologists have been searching for the causeway of the Great Pyramid of Giza for years and years, conducting excavations all over the place with high-tech instruments with no luck. 
This causeway is believed to be a tunnel or a corridor that connected the Great Pyramid to a mysterious Lost Valley Temple. In 2015, an Egyptian resident from the village of El Haraneya in Giza was doing some illegal drilling in his backyard when he found it. He dug 33 feet down and then hit a passage made up of enormous stone blocks. Archaeologists dispatched to the scene by the country's Ministry of Antiquities were shocked. The only thing they had found in the area was some basalt paving and limestone walls. The tunnel's existence was documented in Herodotus's Histories, in which the Greek writer claimed to have visited during the 5th century BC, describing it as being completely enclosed and decorated with beautiful carvings. Archaeologists are now hoping to follow the tunnel to the lost temple of Khufu. They believe it is buried beneath a nearby village. Now they just have to get to it. Lalibela Churches Ethiopia declared Christianity as its official religion around 330 AD, making it one of the world's oldest, if not the oldest, Christian countries in the world. Here you will find some of the earliest Christian churches, carved from a rock deep into the earth. The town of Lalibela contains 11 magnificent 13th century monolithic churches that sit between 131 and 164 feet into the landscape, pierced with cross-shaped openings that allow light into the hollowed-out interior from above. Some say that these churches were built by the Knights Templar, who were at the height of their power at the time. However, there is no concrete evidence of this. They are known for their secrecy, after all. The churches were reportedly built under the orders of King Lalibela, who visited Jerusalem right before its fall to Muslim powers in 1187. He made it his goal to construct a new Jerusalem, welcoming Christian pilgrims after Muslim conquests made the Holy Land too dangerous. Builders started from the surface of the plateau, digging downward forming one giant cube of solid rock. Then artists sculpted rooms, archways, vaults, columns, and doorways for the faithful to enter. But why use such a difficult building technique when easier techniques were known? The Ethiopian Orthodox Church says that an army of angels assisted King Lalibela by building the 11 churches in just one night. From a distance, there is no sign of these churches at all. The only way to know they are there is the steady stream of people coming in and out of crevices in the rock. There are paths and tunnels connecting the 11 churches, sometimes just wide enough for one person. One of the churches, Biete Mitani Alem, is the largest monolithic church in the world. Pilgrims travel hundreds of miles on foot to come here as a demonstration of their faith. On Christmas Eve, around 200,000 people come to worship. Today, the churches are also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Howard Pass Homes Howard Pass is a remote mountain pass located in northern Alaska, over 100 miles from the nearest modern-day villages of Ambler and Kobuk. It's known for its extreme weather and, strangely enough, many archaeological sites, evidence of its past of human habitation. Over the past 11,000 years, it wasn't a quiet place. Archaeologists have found evidence of hundreds of houses and tents that once stood there, and people fashioned tools, stored food, and hunted in the region. Their ability to pass through, let alone stay in the Howard Pass for any length of time, is remarkable, considering the wind speeds and frigid temperatures recorded by its weather station. The Anchorage Daily News noted that on one day in February 2013, it was minus 45.5 degrees Fahrenheit, with a wind chill temperature of minus 96.9 degrees Fahrenheit, and sustained wind speeds hit 54 miles per hour. It's hard to imagine how someone would survive in such bad weather, even with modern conveniences. But it's an absolute wonder that people stayed alive with more primitive living standards in an area where caribou are known to freeze to death. So how did they do it, and why? Evidence shows that winter dwellings in Howard Pass were partially underground and contained cold trap tunnels at the entrances. And the explanation behind people's decision to stay there any longer than they absolutely had to is surprisingly simple. Speaking with the Anchorage Daily News, National Park's archaeologist Jeff Rasick summed it up into a simple statement. It's a reliable place to harvest caribou and there are lakes with fish. If you are someone trying to escape clouds of mosquitoes, winds aren't necessarily bad. And maybe a windswept place is good for winter travel. Hard and crusty, good to get around on. How do you feel about this place? Would you be brave enough to live here for a while? Let me know in the comments below. Hidden Roman Baths while constructing a new major drainage system in the Jordanian capital of Amman, workers recently discovered the ruins of some old Roman baths. The project, intended to divert floodwaters from higher lands that flow into Amman, was temporarily put on hold while officials figure out whether to continue with excavations or go ahead with building the drainage system as planned. Archaeologists have identified signs of sophisticated heating systems at the site, which they believe are the first discovered remnants of the ancient city of Philadelphia, which Amman was built on top of. 
Yazid El Ayan, head of Jordan's Department of Antiquities, told Reuters that the government will balance the needs of the city to protect it from flooding to preserving antiquities under the streets. He added Amman was one of the biggest Roman cities and it has one of the largest baths. Wherever one excavates in Amman, antiquities can be found. Even the modern-day metropolis bears signs of its Roman past, including an amphitheater, the Nymphaeum Fountains, and a temple dedicated to Hercules. But the rapidly growing city of 4 million is suffering from the effects of poor urban planning, leaving officials in the precarious position of having to decide between the well-being of Amman's modern-day residents and preserving its historical integrity. What would you do if you had to decide? Let me know in the comments below. Pompeii of the North the ground beneath London is an archaeological treasure trove containing evidence of centuries upon centuries of continuous occupation. One section of the city, excavated in 2010, was dubbed by some the Pompeii of the North for the sheer number of artifacts recovered and the remarkable state of preservation. Over 14,000 objects from various time periods were found, including coins, ceramic lamps, leather boots and sandals, rare wooden writing tablets, and boxes chock full of pottery. Archaeologists excavated shops, homes, fences, yards, and other structures dating as far back as the early 60s AD. They discovered shopping lists, party invitations, and a sale contract for a slave. Countless other archaeological items spanning a 70,000-year period have turned up in recent years, with many being found as part of the Crossrail Project, a multi-billion dollar mission to carve out 26 miles of tunnels for a new commuter rail line. Among them was the Bedlam Burial Ground, containing the 16th and 17th century graves of radicals, criminals, nonconformists, the insane, the working poor, and other misfits who didn't quite fit in neatly with the rest of society, even in death. Known as London's most diverse cemetery, Bedlam contains an estimated 30,000 burials, over 3,000 of which were exhumed to make room for the Crossrail project. Other discoveries include a chamber pot bearing the lewd saying, Oh, what I see, I will not tell, a Tudor era bowling ball, 55 million year old amber, rare Roman medallions, and Great Plague victims' headstones, just to name a few. Cursed burials and texts. The ancient Egyptian necropolis of Saqqara, located just south of Cairo, seems like the gift that keeps on giving. One discovery after another has made headlines lately, with the most recent being a trove of over 50 cursed wooden sarcophagi, along with a queen's funerary temple and texts from the Book of the Dead. The excavation, led by Egyptologist and former Egyptian minister of antiquities, uncovered 52 sarcophagi dating back over 3,000 years to Egypt's new kingdom. The burials were found roughly 40 feet underground. Anyone who believes in the curse of the pharaohs might say that by disturbing these graves, experts have have subjected themselves to bad luck, illness, or even death, as the curse does not differentiate between one's reasons for digging up a burial. The team also found a 13-foot-long scroll containing excerpts from the Book of the Dead, a collection of spells meant for helping the dead navigate their journey through the underworld. Nearby, archaeologists discovered the funerary temple of Queen Nert, who was buried near her husband King Teti. It's said that King Teti reigned for 12 years before being murdered in 2291 BC. Experts hope that these and other discoveries will help them learn more about Egypt's new kingdom, while the Egyptian government hopes that such findings will eventually help stir an uptick in tourism, which has been severely affected by the global pandemic. Massive Underground City Iranian archaeologists have uncovered what they believe to be the entrance to an ancient underground metropolis. There may be a large, hand-carved subterranean city beneath modern-day Tafresh in central Iran. The governor of Tafresh told the IRNA, Iran's official news agency, that the 7.4-acre site may constitute one of the largest underground archaeological sites in Iran, or even in West Asia. The alleged city was built using a method known as troglodytic architecture, which involves removing material rather than adding to it to make room. This type of building is reportedly common throughout Iran and is an easy way to build in varied climates. By building underground, people who lived in ancient times were better able to regulate the temperature of the interior, regardless of which region they lived in. So far, very little information has been revealed about this place, although it looks like a more intensive excavation is currently underway. Hopefully, archaeologists can share some more details about this mysterious subterranean city. 
food of the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad was not literally underground, but it was a secret movement made up of a network of people to help enslaved African Americans reach freedom. It operated from about the late 18th century and continued through the American Civil War. One of the most famous conductors was Harriet Tubman, who escaped slavery and time and time again helped to guide escaped slaves to freedom. Most people involved in the Underground Railroad were both former slaves and those who were morally opposed to it and wanted it to end. This network of both black and white abolitionists provided shelter and aid, hiding people in their homes and giving them supplies and food as escaped slaves made their journey north, oftentimes to Canada. There have been very few archaeological studies on this made until recently. In 2018, a team excavated near the foundation of a humble two-story structure known as the Bailey Cabin in Cambridge, Maryland. This cabin is located on a property that they believe once housed slaves, and later on, free black laborers. Back in 1857, a slave named Lizzie Amby and her husband Nat fled the property, joining a group of others seeking freedom along the Underground Railroad. The Bailey Cabin tells the story not only of the people who lived and suffered on the plot of land, at the hands of their owners, but also of those who bravely risked their lives to escape captivity. The team found artifacts from before and after freedom was granted to slaves, such as a child's tea set, a doll head, and a rubber comb. Beneath the cabin's floorboards was a garbage pit filled with hundreds of animal bones, including the remains of domestic livestock such as chickens, pigs, cows, and sheep, as well as game animals like rabbits, turtles, ducks, geese, turkeys, pigeons, you name it. Additionally, the team found fish and crabs sourced from the nearby Choptank River. Because of this area's importance to the Underground Railroad, this find shows culinary skills and traditions that may have helped escaped slaves survive along their arduous journey north. Amby and others fled with Harriet Tubman and would return here to help others. A lot of what fugitives would have eaten on the road would have been the same things that they would have eaten in the yard, explained Underground Railroad historian Anthony Cohen. While this all might just be a pile of bones to some, it demonstrates the realities of food and forced labor under slavery. Once the Civil War was underway, the Underground Railroad Railroad moved above ground and became part of the Union versus the Confederacy. Harriet Tubman herself led intelligence operations and worked for the Union Army as a nurse and a spy. Valeri Novi Some underground archaeological discoveries are made without having to actually dig. For example, in mid-2020, researchers from Belgium and the UK announced the discovery of an ancient Roman city known as Valeri Novi using ground-penetrating radar. It's the first time experts have used radar technology to map an entire underground ground city. Located roughly 30 miles outside Rome, it was last inhabited over 1,300 years ago. Valeri Novi was far less grand than some other Roman cities, but it proved to be no less fascinating. It was about half the size of Pompeii, occupying a total area of around 75 acres, but still boasted some trappings of luxury, including upscale homes and shops, some with central heating, a theater, an elaborate bathhouse, at least one public monument, an aqueduct that ran beneath and along the streets, and temples at the city. City's edge. At the city's northern gate, there was a covered passageway measuring over 550 feet long and leading to the street. It's unlike any other structure ever found among Roman ruins. Built in 241 BC, Valeri Novi was one of around 2,000 ancient Roman cities that existed by the 1st century AD. Its last residents vacated the premises around 700 AD during the early medieval period. The layout reveals that it's erroneous to think of Roman towns and cities as being standardized. Not only are some of Valeri Novi's features unique, they are also fancier than archaeologists expected for a small town. Discoveries like this demonstrate the groundbreaking abilities of advanced technology when it comes to exploring sites that are either inaccessible or too expensive to excavate. Thanks for watching! Which discovery was your favorite? Which one was the most surprising? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time! Bye!